Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you're joining us from today. My name's Sarah, and I'm the Program and Event Manager at The Reactor in Sydney, Australia. Uh, welcome to a Microsoft Reactor Sydney live stream event. So today I would like to welcome back George Aterio, who is a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, and his colleagues, Aaron Wislang, who is also a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. And last but not least, we have Renato Groffi, sorry if I said that incorrectly, who is a senior software engineer and a Microsoft MVP. So today they'll be discussing containers on Azure for developers. We will be speaking for about an hour and we'll have some time in there for questions and there'll also be a demo. Um, do send us your questions throughout though and we'll try and answer as many as possible. We'll also share with you a link to our feedback survey uh, with the event code 15943 towards the end. If you have time to fill that out, that would be great. And if you've missed anything to, from today, it'll be available on our YouTube channel straight after today, and we'll share with you the links for that. And anything that they're presenting on today um, between Renato, George, and Aaron, we'll share the links um, for what they'll be discussing throughout. But for now, without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to the team to begin. So thank you and over to you. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Aaron and Renato. My pleasure oh, for, to be here Hello. together. Hello. And um, yeah, if you don't know, I'm a cloud advocate um, on the cloud native space. We work with uh, all the containers, solutions on Azure and for Microsoft, including AKS, container apps, ACI. And we work very close with the open source projects like Kada, DEPA, Brigade, and uh, you know, in order that we support like Cluster API, many projects connect with CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, and also any any Microsoft uh, open source project connected with the Cloud Native space. And welcome, Aaron. Thank you very much, George. So I'm also a teammate of George's. I'm working on, on the Cloud Native side of things, so also languages like Go and a bit of Python and other things like that. Uh, it's great to be here and look forward to uh, chatting with people. Renato, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, it's an honor for me to be <laughs> in this, this live. Uh, many times I, I, I'm I streaming uh, content in Brazilian Portuguese, in, so it's a, a new experience for me uh, to, to share my experience in, in English. I, I, I hope uh, that uh, you can understand what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I'm a software developer. I work with uh, .NET since uh, 2005 and uh, with Azure since uh, 2010. Uh, so uh, I, I, I have uh, some experience with these platforms and uh, since uh, uh, 2016, I'm working with contain containers too, and uh, it's a, a topic that I I like to to study, to to search uh, new things, and uh, for me it will be a a pleasure to to share my my knowledge and uh, also. Uh, understand and uh, learn more uh, about what you and George are doing in, in Microsoft too. Fantastic. I'll ask you one That's brief great. question. What what first started you with containers? Was there a particular project? Was there something that, uh, that got you going and from the previous development work to, to, in the container ecosystem? Well, uh, the first time that I used containers with .NET, I think it uh, was in 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was a, a, a proof of concept uh, in, the, in the beginning. Uh, so uh, after some time, we uh, had uh, some, some projects being deployed in production using containers, but uh, in the beginning, uh, there was some uh, resistance about these uh, new technologies. Uh, 
uh, in Brazil, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, projects uh, using uh, inter internet information services and yes. people in, in the first moment was uh, afraid about all the uh, all the changes uh, that were uh, hap that were, uh, were happening né, with the .NET platform and the, and the Azure. It's interesting. I was actually a, a, a .NET developer quite a, from quite early on in my career, around 1.0, 1.1, and for quite a number of years after that. So I'm very familiar with that stack and the IIS and et cetera before I moved on to Python, doing a lot of Go as well um, to this day. But it, the mindset shift was very interesting going from application servers where we'd co-locate a lot of different applications on a single web server often, right? not even scale out, and sort of decomposing those things and putting them in containers for the first time was a big thing for, for so many developers. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. And then that jump for going from, hey, I can containerize my application to then uh, container orchestration with Kubernetes is just another universe so many developers have jumped into. It's, uh... Yes, uh, for uh, many .NET developers here in Brazil uh, to use command line, Linux, and uh, a lot of uh, open source technologies in in the first moment, it was a, a shock. Yeah. Uh, everyone uh, was uh, were al always using uh, Microsoft technologies, and uh, 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 it was uh, um, a moment to everyone uh, rethink about <laughs> what what. what we are, we were studying, né? and uh, yes. try to learn new technologies and uh, try to improve uh, our skills too. That's great, Aaron. Renato, Renato is, is very modest. He is, he is one of the mainstreamers in Brazil. He has a channel with like 30, 40,000 followers and um, he does streams every week with you know hundreds or sometimes even thousands of people watching. And uh, I did one last week, and that when uh, I have this slide deck here from the last week, mm -hmm. okay, it's not in Portuguese, it's in English as well. I can share just because there are the cadre and you know projects that you're going to talk here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe you can you can start with this one, okay? And um, let me just get here one second. Then it. I know that you have some demos prepared there or recorded as well that you want to show. Absolutely. I think it would be nice to see because the idea of the you know similar presentation we I talked with Renato in Portuguese last week was how we you know going from from you know from the last five years where we started doing that, there are a lot of people that never really got involved with containers. And how we can get those people on board and understand how, you know, which technology we are using. And let me just get this. And if you haven't uh, jumped into containers yet, it's become quite a lot easier in the past few years. I remember the earlier days of Docker and uh, particularly the early days of Kubernetes and container orchestration, uh, we had a lot more rough edges. But I can tell you year, year over year, it's never been a better time to come into the ecosystem and explore things and uh, and look at you know, some of your developer workflows and the workflows around containers as well, um, which I think are equally important, particularly around things like GitHub and all the tooling we have in the cloud. The time is ours now. The right time is ours right now. And um, yeah, I'm loading here the, the PowerPoint. But the main thing is, one of the first thing people ask as a developer, uh, let's focus on the development. And that's what Renato is, you know, I expect as well on the .NET side more, but he also does, you know, on the containers is how we get started on the my local environment. I have Visual Studio Code, I have Visual Studio, um, what I need to install, you know, um, sometimes uh, people say I don't have uh, my laptop or my desktop, it's not good enough, I don't have enough CPU, I don't have enough normally memory, you know, and um, what options we have to do that development. I think, Karen, you have something there on Code Space as well. Yes. And 
Can I'll, talk, yeah, let's just start I'll talk through. Discussing. I'll talk through very, very briefly. So when we started, uh, you know, early on when I joined Microsoft, we meet a lot of developers, particularly in enterprises, who are very, very new to containers. Uh, and the first thing that we would do in a maybe a hack, which might be last three or four days, five days, uh, on that first morning, everybody in the room would have to set up their laptops and install all the dependencies. And uh, in the first stage, it was Docker. So Docker is your, uh, you know, it's the tooling that made containers popular. Uh, it runs on your local machine. If you're running Windows, it runs a small Linux VM there, which can run Linux containers. Uh, so by and large, most of the containers you'll encounter will be Linux containers. And containers, if you're not familiar with them, are a technology for iso kernel features for isolating your application's processes. They work at the process uh, level, and they isolate them and provide access to the resources that they need and the isolation um, to isolate them from other processes. We also have container images, which allow you to bundle your, con your application and its dependencies into this concept we have as a container image, and then a container registry, which allows us to distribute these images. We push the image to the container registry, and then it can be pulled down by other users, by other virtual machines, by container orchestrators like Kubernetes, um, et cetera. So, We'd start off and everybody would go to install these things and people would try and they'd say, oh, my machine doesn't run virtual machines. So half the company has a lockdown, you know, VM and that kind of thing. And that uh, they'd spend time installing all, all of that kind of stuff. Now, these days we have options. So we can install Docker locally on our machine. It's become very, very popular. Most IT departments know what Docker is and will gladly uh, let you use it for your developer purposes. But we also have the ability to do this kind of thing in the cloud. So with Visual Studio, uh, sorry, Visual Studio Code, we also have a cloud version of that uh, running on inside of GitHub called GitHub Code Spaces. And that brings uh, Visual Studio Code inside of your browser on a virtual machine, which is running in the cloud on demand. And it also lets you run Docker. So you can have a, a full terminal there running on a Linux VM, lets you work with all of the dependencies and other things you might need, and it pins it to a particular repository. So you can basically show up to a, a specific GitHub repository, open up this thing called a GitHub code space, you get full Visual Studio in your browser, and you get a terminal, and everything you need to run containers is right there. So you don't even need a local developer setup um, either. So that there's various powerful options like that. All of this is available across Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, and then we also have different workflows depending on whether you're working locally, you're the developer, you're hacking, you're building your application into a container, uh, versus whether you're, um, you know, you're working with CI CD platforms such as GitHub Actions or something like that. All of these things we have can build the container for you. Um, even uh, Azure container registries, like such as Azure Container Registry, can build the container for you. So, for many workflows, the requirement for even local dependencies on Docker has kind of gone away. And we'll look at some of those things um, down the road as well. Yeah, I, I just put like the you know the slide I was using last week, and uh, sorry, don't have real names here, but um, um, the the whole idea of that presentation was explaining what CNCF is because on the cloud native space, CNCF is the foundation where Kubernetes is the main project, let's say, and have all the ecosystem around containers, microservices, any product that is considered like a cloud native product. And Aaron and I work a lot on those kind of projects. I'm not sure if you have not got involved yet on any of the CNCF projects. And the main projects for us at the moment are like Kada, Depa, and Brigade. Um, that's our normally projects that Microsoft get involved. There is OSM, Open Service Mesh as well. Um, and, um, and Kubernetes itself, you know, all the ecosystem there. But the idea is, if you, if you can understand, you know, how we can leverage those products or those projects on our, you know, projects on our solutions is one very important thing for the developers. How they do it, they have to go there and try to dig those projects like we do and see what kind of project can help them on the development for something, for caching, for ingress, for monitoring, so many different options there, storage, scaling, brigade for, you know, asynchronous scripting. So many options there. I think there's like... All of 
all of these things can be quite through. overwhelming. I think if the first thing you heard about containers and orchestrations, et cetera, was the, the CNCF, you could find it very overwhelming. If you look at the, what they call the cloud, the CNCF uh, landscape, it's this giant, uh, you know, poster with all of the different technologies and all of the different projects and, and so forth. And it, you, you sort of zoom in, uh, it, it's quite an eye chart. And for everything, what we learn about the, this community in particular is that everything is very composable. So if you're used to, say, a traditional Microsoft stack, we traditionally it's been fairly prescriptive. You have, you know, the Visual Studio, you have the web application platform, you have the framework, you have all of these different things. But when you come into this very open landscape, you get to choose. Uh, you know, you have a container orchestrator, but then you have your monitoring systems. Uh, such as Prometheus, which is the second project inside of the CNCF, but then you go to other networking. Every part of the stack, you can choose something that suits your particular uh, need um, or has, has the particular trade-offs that, that you're looking for. So in that sense, it can be quite overwhelming, and it's very hard to just go out there and say, well, just use this and then this, and this is my favorite project over here. So what I like to do is draw it back to individual developer workflows. So if you're at, from an app owner's perspective, so if you're sitting there and you have an app, maybe it's in .NET or it's in Python or it's in Go, where, where would you start? Yeah, I, I like the definition there. That's why I think, you know, CNCF here coming for CNCF. I, I was, you know, CNCF.io and many people, you know, what's cloud native? Oh, it runs on, on a public cloud, is a cloud native. Not really, it's not that, you know, and then you have to understand. And many there people is see a, that different. There How is, is a lot different? of misunderstanding about the concept of cloud native. Here in Brazil, uh, many people uh, uh, think that, uh, well, we are on the cloud, so we have cloud native in our projects. <laughs> the, uh, if you use uh, some specific technology from some vendor, uh, not always you are using some cloud native technology. And I think also yeah. when people hear cloud native, what they hear by default is containers. And that's not necessarily yep. the, the, the main importer of, of the thing here at all. Um, it's it's the, the entire approach, the, the techniques, the loosely coupled systems, the resilient, manageable, observable, all of these things that uh, you know, we, we didn't have, in, at least in standardized forms, for sure. Um, 12 factors. Back, declarative, declarative APIs in particular. I think a lot of things inside the cloud native ecosystem are pinned to this idea of the API platform that, say, Kubernetes has brought along and enabled us and unlocks all of the, um, you know, the openness um, around that. Yeah, I, I, I see, you know, cloud native as I'm developing an application that I care about scaling. I care where I'm sharing my state. Um, you know, .NET is very common, Renato, people coming from session, session state that used to run in memory on the server. And you could never scale that. And in .NET, you could scale for like something like Red's cache the session, like old.net, that's still in production. Those products are still in production. And many people are moving those to VMs because they don't think they can deploy that like in our Windows containers, but they can. And that's available on .net since long for a long time where you can you know move those things outside. You can use SQL Server, you can use Red Cache, and then even old applications, you can you know kind of modernize a little bit. And it's not that hard. <clears throat> and you can make that to be more cloud native approach. Don't have to be micro, fully microservice to be you know, some way cloud native. It's not going to be a fully, let's say, cloud native. But things like service mesh, microservice, immutable, you're not going to update. You're not going to patch your application you know, like on the application that's running there. You're not going to patch the server anymore. Like that's where container helps. You can do that with VMs. You agree? You can do immutable infrastructure with VMs, and you know just maybe the image start again. And we do a lot of that with like VM scale sets. You can do something similar. It means that it's not just containers, but 
is more used by you know containers. Hybrid clouds is is something that normally you don't talk much when you talk about cloud native, but you have to think about this. It's portability as well. Um, you know, I think portability, mutable, and think about that as a service, as microservice. With Depo now, bring something that's a sidecar, is always like a separate process that's going to you know, do something for you. And um, yeah, the next slide here is exactly what Aaron was talking, the projects. And then we, you know that we have, you know, graduated, incubating, and we have sandbox projects. Graduated are the main projects uh, like production, you know, um, I think the incubating is the, the next generation that's coming to be, you know, graduating soon. They're getting close. And you can see on the graduated that Kubernetes is the main one here. Prometheus that you just talked about. Helm is a main project for Microsoft, came from Microsoft. We came from, originally um, from Deus Labs, so we work on it. We uh, originally uh, started by Deus Labs, and we uh, acquired exactly. Deus Labs, and a lot of the maintainers came and uh, helped continue to build Helm at Microsoft. But it's very much now, it's a community-driven thing across the spectrum. I think that's the wonderful thing about uh, Cloud Native ecosystem and the CNCF, is that it is very uh, broad. From a, It's not a, a vendor thing in that sense. Um, so we can... We don't That's very at... important. That's very important. It's just, it's not, there are people here from, you know, all the main players on the technology market and um, professionals, anyone that want to help, they are open source projects. You can be part of it. Uh, of these uh, uh, graduated projects, uh, Jaeger is a interesting option uh, if you need to do tracing your applications. I, I use it with uh, .NET projects and uh, you can uh, log uh, SQL statements, uh, uh, communication between services and uh, in .NET it's uh, very easy to, to implement and uh, so if uh, anyone uh, watching uh, this live and uh, it's uh, searching for a solution for, for tracing Jaeger. It's uh, an excellent option for, for this. And for anybody watching, if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, questions, or feedback, um, of, you know, the things you're interested in, what you're working with today, um, we'd love to hear them. They'll filter through the chat here. So uh, please feel free to ask away. Yeah, yeah the questions are very welcome. and. Um, I can bring some questions from last week as well, and then I have to answer all the questions. I see some, um, I see some logos here too. So I'll speak to those. You talked about Helm a little bit, uh, George. So I, I do have some favorite things on that pre on that previous slide. So obviously yeah. we have Kubernetes and we have uh, Prometheus as well, and we have some other you know, Helm, which we talked about you know, having acquired the company that uh, had many of the maintainers have also gone on to start other startups and other things in the cloud native ecosystem, which is, is fantastic. But we have two particular projects here that we initiated at Microsoft, but are very much vendor neutral um, and broad based uh, community first projects. And these are Cada, which is the Kubernetes event driven auto scaler. And this brings some fun functionality to Kubernetes. Um, so Kubernetes uh, has the ability to scale workloads via its internal auto scaling um, capabilities, the um, horizontal pod auto scaler, but this brings event driven auto scaling to Kubernetes so that you have all of these different event sources. They could be queues, they could be streams, they could be um, events of all different kinds and even custom events that you can create. And you want to be able to scale this out on a Kubernetes cluster with arbitrary containers that you've created um, et cetera. And all of these event sources here, and I think there's I've just got a ballpark and says about 30. I, I know that will be wrong, but it's, it's about that. Um, and they can drive uh, auto scaling capability inside of your, your Kubernetes cluster. And this is both managed services, such as you know, there's managed services in Azure for queues and streams and all that kind of thing. And across all the major public clouds, all of these have um, all of these scalers. And then there's also many, many open source projects as well. So if you look at things like RabbitMQ or databases or Redis, uh, you don't have to pick a particular vendor or anything like that. And one project that I've been working on with a 
colleague Aaron Schlesinger is called Cater HTTP. And that brings, this is inside the CNCF project, which brings the ability to auto scale containers inside of Kubernetes for HTTP applications. So this might be a web API, might be in a website or in, in any kind of HTTP endpoint. And it will scale according to the traffic, according to the number of requests that are coming in. And it's built on top of Cater, which has this um, control loop to be able to scale out the, the workloads. And then the, uh, the metrics, essentially, or the, the, the requests are controlled by Cater HTTP. And then that can scale out all of these different things. So that's one particularly interesting project, um, which allows you to treat Kubernetes um, as a very elastic pool of compute or to be able to put very elastic workloads on, on top of it. And Aaron, that that um, Kada HTTP is already available on Azure Container Apps. Uh, so Kada HTTP. So we have Kada is actually part of uh, Azure Container Apps, uh, particularly for the background processing um, capabilities. Kada can auto. So we have a, a managed container service for serverless containers inside of um, Kubernetes, and so sorry, inside of inside of Azure, which is built atop these open source projects. So it is built on top of Kubernetes. It's built on top of the uh, ingress called Envoy, which is a very popular ingress uh, platform. And we use our own open source projects such as Kada for scaling, uh, particularly for background processes and, and these kind of event-driven workloads. And we also use uh, another project, which was on the previous slide, called Dapper, which is a distributed application runtime, which makes it easier for you to build distributed applications with things like uh, remote service invocation, the ability to work with many different types of state stores with a unified API, um, the ability to do things like publish and subscribe, and also things like tracing uh, and observability that uh, Renato just mentioned. Uh, there are many different uh, pluggable backends, and you don't have to care about what the implementation is on the backend. You don't have to care about whether you're getting your, let's say in this case, your pub sub from a your managed cloud service inside of Azure or from something on another cloud or from an open source thing, which is right there inside your cluster. It uses these building blocks to be able to um, address all of this in a cloud and vendor agnostic way. And you see here an example of, uh, of the secrets management and state management. All of these are behind a single consistent API. And it also brings a, another concept, which is a, the sidecar. So whether you're running this inside of Azure Container Apps or you're running it inside of Azure Kubernetes Service, Dapper just sits next to your application as another container um, inside of what we call a pod inside of Kubernetes. And it's just a service which is right there that can be accessible. And it brings all of this rich capability to your application without you having to write any additional code. So you don't have to care about what language you're currently using. You don't have to care about implementing things like retry and back off and all the tracing aspects or partic implementing particular types of persistence. All of this kind of stuff comes along for free because you're using an open source battle tested you know, implementation mm -hmm. of all of these distributed systems concepts. And this is... And, and the nice thing there is that like language agnostic means that like Renato was talking about .NET and you can see on that slide Jaeger at the top here means that they're, they're using like those, you know, building blocks like, like you said, connectors where you can, you can swap, let's say, maybe I'm not using that in development, but in production I can just say I want to use I want to send all my logs or my tracing uh, metrics to to something like Jaeger or maybe App Insights or New Relic, and you don't have to change anything in your code. It will be just changing the configuration and tell you where you want to send that, and that's and, where the magic that that does. And you see here we talk about .NET, and we we'll talk about um, you know inside the middle here between your app and Dapper. This is mostly handled by first-class SDKs. So we have first-class SDKs support across all the major languages. But then you can also uh, speak uh, HTTP or gRPC right to that same API and that same consistent API service. So you could have a little bit of Python. You could have some Bash, which can invoke these endpoints on the sidecar, and all of the same things happen. Um, so it really is both langu language and technology and, and agnostic from, from that perspective. It's not even... Uh, you don't have to use Kubernetes, like you can use that but even as a process. The sidecar will be just like a, let's say, 
a Windows Server, so like a process that's running in parallel to your application, where you can use gRPC for faster communication. You'll be, you know, like, you don't have to use HTTP. There is some delay on that. gRPC will be very fast. And it'll be just like assistant here that say, I want to talk with oh, another service. I don't know where the service is. They're going to do service discovery for us. They're going to keep all the tracing. And we don't have to change our code for that. Like I said, there's a simple, there are SDKs for all the main language where you have to call a simple call to use those service or those building blocks. And this is an uh, example of, a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Renat. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, a, a big advantage of uh, the solution uh, proposed by Dapper is the, the use of open telemetry. Uh, you can integrate with uh, Jaeger application sites, new Relic, Zipkin, uh, and even uh, uh, out of Dapper, if you have uh, an application created with, with .NET, uh, Java, Node, uh, you can use uh, the, the libraries uh, of Open Telemetry to, to integrate with uh, the solutions. Uh, Dapper uh, integrates uh, with Open Telemetry, but uh, if you are not using uh, Dapper, uh, you can also use, uh, use uh, Open Telemetry to uh, implement observability in your, in your projects. And uh, about sidecar, uh, if you are going to implement uh, this in Kubernetes, you, you need to create another application uh, and uh, think about all the process of communication uh, to inform if your applica your main application is health or not, uh, and Dapper uh, delivers this uh, without a lot of complexities. It's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all about the, the development life cycle. You know, it can be shorter. You can save resource because there's a lot of things on that, but that you don't have to implement yourself. Like Aaron was saying, he tries. We never did like he tries on HTTP calls. If you call like a microservice and that microservice is offline, what happens if you do like a synchronous or, or something? If you do a synchronous, you still don't have the retries, and Dapper can give you that out of the box without you spending any time on that. Authentication as well, you can see JWT tokens. Okay, there's a lot of things that are inside there that I think we recommend you to have a look. And that's just going to grow on our platforms. And Dapper now is fully integrated with container apps. Means that you can have data for scaling your, you know, your container apps. And let's go for container apps a little bit, because I think that's something we want to discuss for the developers. And uh, many people ask, what you know, Azure service should I start using for containers? We have app service, Azure Container Instance. Now we have Azure Container Apps. You have Azure Kubernetes service. Pretty much that. When you say app service for containers, that's very specific. Um, we can say, Aaron, at least I can say that, you know, that I think today Azure Container Apps is still in public preview, but it's safe to say that's the best option for development, not for production yet. But if you want to use it with containers, probably it will be the easier way for you to get started. There's a, a lot of features come, you know, now in April, in early May, that will be more feature complete you know, for development, then now will be the recommended way and you'll be like serverless. You don't have to care about the whole AKS to get started. And you can use, like you say, Envoy Proxy for ingressing. You can use Kader for scaling, Depa for microservice. And you have all that integration to do, you know, traffic split like you have on app service with uh, slots, deployment slots, but you can do like things like blue green deployments. Um, we can also have this integration with secrets. 
There are custom domain certificates all coming as well very soon. Um, how do you see that, Aaron, for the developers that, you know, they, how they can use that to get started? So I think this is interesting because early on we were talking about the CNCF and the cloud native ecosystem and Kubernetes and then get how people get into these things. And I think we've sort of thrown people in the deep end there and say we've got this huge ecosystem where you can buy into anything and everything's composable and all of these things that might be a bit overwhelming, et cetera. Yeah. But put simply, from a developer perspective, uh, container apps give you a serverless container experience. And all of these things that we've talked about, such as the open source projects, which you can go and consume yourself, such as Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaling and Dapper and uh, you know metrics and, and all of these other pieces, you get these for free when you use a managed platform, such as Azure Container Apps, which is implementation of serverless containers. And you don't have to think about it. You don't have to care about it. You don't have to maintain it or install it or configure it. Um, it you, you get all of that uh, sort of free. And it is the fastest way of saying, I have a container, run it for me. I don't care how. Uh, just you know, it's a, it's a web app. It's a web app, or it could be a background job or something like that. It's designed to take away all of the concerns around. I have a, a cluster, or I need to think about machines or sizes or anything like that. All of those things give you a tremendous amount of power, and they're very important in their place. But for so many applications, what you really want to do is say, I have this container. The container is the contract. Run it for me, and then scale it. Give me logs. Give me. Um, all of these th things that we need um, to be able to, to run it. And I can actually show you a, a brief uh, demo soon about um, how you can just get one up and running very, very quickly from the CLI, uh, right from taking your code, building it actually inside of a container registry, inside of Azure Container Registry, and uh, then deploying it uh, to Azure Container Apps, just so you can see how easy it is uh, from, a, from just a pure uh, web API standpoint. Um, but this is, it's a very new service. I'm very, very excited about it. Uh, there's lots to do. I think it is one of the most broadly accessible services for uh, containers uh, on Azure from that perspective. And certain workloads may graduate. You know, you could take and say, we need this complexity. We're going to move to Azure uh, Kubernetes service or something like that um, because of all of the richness that that provides and all of the, you can absolutely compose your entire stack there. Um, and make all of these things work. But you get the benefit of the same underlying open source components that are available directly inside of Azure Container Apps to, to be able to run them yourself on your own Kubernetes cluster or run them on-premises as well. So you have that whole spectrum um, of options. But one of the options I think would be valuable to talk about, say, I'm a developer, I have some code, um, I need to get it to the cloud and I need to get it running as a container because I think that's what many people um, sort of care about in the initial instance because you're building an app and you want to take it to the cloud. So I could show us a brief demo, if you like, George, um, about of container. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I just, um, there's a slide here that you're probably going to do one of those demos. You, yes, yes. You know, oh, yes. Where as your container apps can, can be used. And this is a very good point. Processing or more like a microservice that you're going to do it. So this is for a very interesting um, point here because we, when we think about um, these applications, you could be presenting something that speaks HTTP to the cloud, which is designed to be consumed, like an API or you know, a full-on website, a Django, Python app, or something like that. Um, but container apps also supports things like background processing and the ability to uh, do things on according event-driven according to queues, like we were talking about Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler. Um, and these things, they don't have to be HTTP applications. Um, and the microservices capability or the service-to-service -service communication um, is unlocked and, and enhanced by things like Dapper, et cetera. Um, but you can sort of scale into that um, capability um, wherever you want. So what we'll show off right now is just an absolute uh, straightforward Python application. It's using um, uh, Fast API and PyPy. It's an application that a teammate of mine, Anthony Shaw, built on the on the Python team, um, and just was containerized and able to be built. So it's coming straight out of his uh, sample repo. All he has is his code, a Docker file, and we have the Azure CLI installed. And we're going to take you along that very very quickly in just a few minutes to be able to um, to be able to run that and and see it running up in container apps. So I think if we could share uh, my screen here, I have the one with the black screen. I don't know if I yeah, can. Yeah, try to share your screen. 
Uh, so it's not that one. Um, let's see if it's the other. It's the one with the black screen here. I don't know if we can see it. That's the one there. Excellent. So this is the uh, so this is Visual Studio Code. This is actually one of my favorite tools here. Um, inside of it, it's called the Terminal Inside Editor Area. So you can create a, t a, a terminal. This is on my Mac, uh, which is running inside of the Editor Area, and you can run all your commands in here. But that's just how I'm using it at the moment. So it's a thing here. So we can see here that we've got a Python application at Tony Baloney slash Ants Azure Demos, and I'm going to pull out some code from that. And we'll see, I'm just uh, cloning it down. One thing I will mention is you can go through this uh, sort of lab walkthrough at aka.ms slash OSS dash labs, uh, drill down into cloud native and you'll see this same walkthrough and you'll see all the steps if you want to just go through this uh, end to end. And it's also got links to the quick starts inside of the Microsoft docs, uh, which is what all of these things um, are based on. You can go through and you can get more context um, and do it. So what we're looking here is at container apps and also Azure Container Registry. So if we go through here, we're going to hop into the subfolder called PyPy Fast API Container Instances, and we're going to set some environment variables. Now, this, these are bash environment variables. You see we've got a resource group, which is a grouping of resources inside of Azure, which we deploy into. We have a location where we're going to deploy our application. In this case, it's be Canada Central up here in Toronto, where I'm streaming from. And we have a container apps environment. And this is a collection of container apps. It's an environment where you can deploy uh, individual container apps, and it's in this particular region in, in Canada Central. We have a couple of other things here. Uh, subscription ID, we're just grabbing a subscription ID, and we're generating a little random uh, string here so that we can give our Azure Container Registry, our ACR here, a globally unique name, and that's just because this is available on the public internet anywhere. And we're also defining a Azure Container Registry uh, and name for our image, and we're just calling this PyPy Fast API Latest. So we're going to reuse this throughout the throughout the demo. So if we go here, we can see that we're going to create a resource group. So we've created a resource group inside of Azure. Probably familiar if you're familiar with Azure, you've probably created one by now. And then we're creating an Azure Container Registry. And in this case, you can see that we have the name. We give a SKU. This is a basic Azure Container Registry, so it's quite cost effective. And we're also enabling the admin capabilities so that we have the username and the password that uh, can be used to access the Container Registry later on. And next, we have this AZ ACR build command. Now, this is quite important because it unlocks us from having to use Docker locally on our machine. It's using the Azure CLI to package up our code, including the Docker file sending it up to the container registry where it gets built uh, inside of the container registry. So I don't have to build it locally and then push it. Uh, this all happens off my machine inside the container registry and the image is then available. So it's going through here, it's installing all the requirements, it's installing PyPy, it's installing Fast API. This particular image has a, quite a few layers. Um, I'd recommend compressing some of those um, later on, maybe using something like a, a distro list container image but at the end of this, you'll see that the image gets built and you get an image inside of the container registry, um, which will be able to be accessed via those credentials. So that's that first step, that code to cloud experience. We've created the registry. We've built our application inside the registry. You didn't have to see it. I pulled it straight out of GitHub. You can, you can go, and, go and visit that. And then we're going to just define a couple of environment, more environment variables here which will be the fully qualified name of our container registry. So you can see here that I've got the ACR name dot azurecr.io slash my image name. So that will give us a fully qualified name for this built image that's up there in the cloud. And then we're going to grab the name of the registry. We're going to have the registry server to log in and some credentials, a username, which is also happens to be the name of the Azure Container Registry, and the password, which we return from this azacr credential show command. So it extracts the password, stores an environment variable, and you can see what the fully qualified name of the image looks like here. So once you've got your image, this is one of the fastest ways of getting it up and running in the cloud with uh, Azure Container Apps. So we have this thing in the Azure CLI called uh, an extension, called the Container App Extension, that brings the capability um, for the AZ Container App uh, commands that we're going to want to run. And these will make their way into the core extension as it comes into um, public preview. So now we have this AZ Container App 
environment create command. We're using the name of the environment. We're creating up in, in Toronto here. It's also generating something, creating something called an Azure Log Analytics workspace. Uh, some of you may be familiar with. Um, and this is where all your application logs, et cetera, will, will uh, be streamed from all of the different containers that are running um, on, the, on the platform. And this is probably, this takes a, you know, maybe a, a couple of minutes or so uh, to spin up. But once you've done this once, you don't have to do it again. Uh, every container app that you create uh, will be created in this same environment. And this is the logical grouping of your applications. If they need to be in a particular region, if they're for a particular purpose, you can think of these environments as your isolation boundary um, for your applications. And one thing I'll mention is this is completely serverless. So this is a serverless platform, which is built by the uh, duration that your container is running in per request as well. So it has a serverless billing model. It's not a uh, compute you know, per hour VM billing model or, or per minute or, or down to the second billing model uh, for VMs. It is a fully serverless. You pay only for the time that your actual container is running or working or receiving requests. So it's very scalable in that regard. So you can see that we've created an environment. And then this is the command that creates your container. AZ container app create. We've got the name of the container, the resource group, the environment, the image, some credentials to log into our private container registry because Azure Container Registry is private. If it was a public one, it would just pull down. And we've just created one with a, a one gigabyte of RAM, half a core, and we have the endpoint here. So we could echo, echoed out our endpoint, which is my container app dot kind tree, this generated thing for us, dot app Canada Central, that's our environment. And this is what we call a revision. So baked into this platform, we have the ability to have multiple revisions of your application. When you roll out a new version, it's that's another revision. If you want to be able to split traffic between uh, multiple uh, instances of versions of your application, maybe you want to do some A-B testing or something like that, there's traffic splitting capabilities baked into the platform. But we don't need to worry about any of that right now. We have the URL. And this is just a, a Python application, which we're going to uh, just run curl against. It's got an API endpoint called locations, which has a bunch of different locations for a particular thing that it's a database that's populated. And you can, you can see it up and running. So that was basically how quick it was to get one of these things up and running. We'll echo that out again, open it up in a browser. You can see that's not found. So we're going to go and add the locations endpoint um, over here. And you can, you can see that in the browser. And we'll hop over to the Azure portal, just a second, and just see the resources that are being created. But that is how fast it can be to get a single container up and running in the cloud with, on a serverless container platform um, with Azure Container Apps. And you can see here that we have the different uh, things. We have the container app itself inside of Azure. We have the container app environment. We have the uh, container registry we created, and we have the workspace for our log analytics. Um, so all of these things are just uh, there and available to us. Do you have any questions or thoughts, George or Renato? Uh, I, I already said to, to George, uh, here in Brazil, in some events about containers and Kubernetes, uh, people always present something like uh, Kubernetes the next day uh, after... Uh, day two operations. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, I think with uh, container apps, you can uh, have a, a lot of productivity and uh, save a lot of time uh, because you don't need to, to uh, configure a lot of services in a cluster. Uh, everything is... Uh, delivered by by Microsoft uh, by default so I think it's uh, easier to uh, to adopt kubernetes and containers when you you need scalability and uh, uh, a lot of good practices uh, using contain, uh, containers with applications 
And we led with a, quite a bit of complexity and, and richness in the early stages there. So that this is something that a developer can pick up very, very quickly, provided you can provide a, a Docker file you know, with your code and your application. You've got just a few commands to actually getting it up and running in, in that form in the cloud. You don't have to understand all the complexities of Kubernetes, networking, and uh, communications, um, et cetera. So it's very powerful from that regard. And the other aspect is there are various ways to get your container images in various places you can you can run and host them. And so from a workflow, there's the multiple workflows you can say, I build my image locally and I push it to a container registry that could be Azure Container Registry, it could be Docker Hub, it could be something like that. Um, but the second most important thing is also having them built into something like a, a CI CD pipeline. Um, where such as GitHub Actions, which can build your container for you. You get that automated um, you know, Git workflow. You're just thinking about your code. You're no longer thinking about how you get your container image and all of that kind of thing. And then you have multiple container images, one per you know, build or one per release, et cetera, and you can always roll back. That workflow, I think, brings a lot of um, benefits to most developers. It's one of the things that they get a tremendous amount of value from upfront before they even think about container orchestration. And if we have time, I have a, a very brief uh, thing I can show a similar sample app with the inside of GitHub. Just, just some minute there. I, I would like to share my screen here as well. Yes, please do. Um, then, because it's like, like a complement for what you just showed there on container apps. If I can share my screen there, yep. You see, I have like Visual Studio, the full Visual Studio that's on Windows, where I have like a simple, you know, normal like web application just like a hello world, you know, like a based web application template. Where now, if you download the latest Visual Studio 2022 preview 2.1, uh, that was just released last week, I think. And they they give a new option now for you to, to go back here. When you right click publish, you have an option for, for Azure and inside Azure you have Azure Container Apps Preview for Linux. Like I said, there is no Windows containers on, on Azure Container Apps, only Linux containers. And now you can publish. I just created one here for you guys to see how that works. And if I go on my Azure portal, you can see the one that I just created. Means that I have a environment, Azure Container Apps environment created. Um, that's that what go Azure Ta Apps. And I publish that application from my Visual Studio and I publish it here. Now, if I go back there and I can finish, you know, how Visual Studio works, they create like a publish, I think, a XML profile. configuration mm -hmm. where I can, like a profile where they can reuse to publish your application. That's a very Once familiar you application the first time, they say if you go here and you create on that plus, you can see that you can create another application. They're going to create like a random name here, a unique name, and you can select the container environment or even create a new container environment from here. I have one created already, and you can put a container name. I did that already, and from this one, once you create the first time, they just put like a hello world image, okay? Just to like a you know default, back screen for your container apps means that the application is running. If I go here now and I click on the URL, that's the Hello World application that was deployed when you created, similar to App Service, when you create like, like an input page there. Now you have this. And now once you, you finish you know, the published configuration, they're going to ask you for the Azure Container Registry. I have one Azure Container Registry where you can save the image that you're creating. Let's finish that. They're going just to create a profile, like you said, that the published profile. Once that profile is published or is created, you can say publish. When you hit the, the button publish, I can close that one. Now I can hit the button publish, selecting the new profile that I just created. And what that's going to do, that's going to build the image locally. Then if you don't know, I'm using Docker Desktop. That's one of the two options that I gave. Using Docker Desktop, using Rancher Desktop. And 
In this case, I'm using, you know, Docker desktop. And my Visual Studio is using Docker desktop. It's failing here at the moment. I think I have too many things open. Oh, I just updated to .NET 6 and it's crashing here. But how that works? They're going to build here locally my Docker image using this Docker file. There's a Docker file here. I just updated my .NET 6 and I think it's not working. I had to download the image. But they're going to use this, dot, um, this Docker file to build the image, push to the Docker Azure Container registry. And then the, the Azure Container apps is going to just deploy the application. And you're going to see the application deployed on your portal like that. And like you, 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 you just demonstrate that on the command line, you can have the revisions. I think that's an important thing Aaron to show is the revision. Yeah, that's a capability. Web service three. is like slots. Let's compare with his slots. Where you create like new revision, let's say you have now a version 1.1 or version two, and you want to do like a blue green deployment. You deploy version two, you give some traffic, like a canary traffic, like 20%. Then once that, that version two is okay, you can just do the traffic splitting 100% for the new version and just the old version will be, will be removed. And that's how it can be done. On App Service, you can just swap. This one is even better because you can have multiple versions and even run multiple versions at the same time. If you want to test like even version, three versions at the same time, you can do traffic split for multiple versions. I don't think you can do that on App Service. And, um, and also you can manage ingress and all the, the configuration that you have, including metrics that's integrated with log analytics. And um, I think the, there are more features coming, like we said, custom domain, certificates for you know, SSL. At the moment, you can use the, the, the domain that we are you know, providing using this long URL here. You can see Azure Container Apps I.O. That's the, the one that you're using. The same thing that you have on App Service, you provide a URL as a HTTPS out of the box, but now you're going to be able to use your custom domain as well very soon. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's great. I d didn't see a single terminal. So I come from a you know, very Linux heavy terminal driven background and we have uh, you know, the VS Code, the uh, Visual Studio experience, the full Visual Studio experience, which didn't require touching any of those things. And it was very um, you know, driven and accessible. Um, and then, of, of course, you talk about things like, um, you know, GitHub and GitHub Actions as the sort of the one of the third ways we can sort of get our container images and deploy them. Uh, Container Apps has support, full support for uh, deploying via, uh, via GitHub Actions to Container Apps as well. It'll deploy new revisions. There's something in the uh, in the quick starts and tutorials for that. Uh, we helped build some of the quick starts and tutorials. Uh, George built the background processing one, helped with the Dapper and others, which you can uh, see links to at aka.ms slash OSS labs, um, including the one we've just gone through now. Um, do we want to have a brief look at uh, how we can build container images uh, inside of GitHub container? Sorry, GitHub container registry with GitHub Actions. Yeah, you have that I'll, on CodeSpace. If you want to share your screen, and, yeah, uh, and actually, this there. one's not on CodeSpace. This one's actually something people can go and walk through, uh, similar to the last one. I'm just going to share my thing here. If we can pop that up on the screen, I think it's live now. Yeah. In the meantime, there are two questions here about comparing uh, Kdo with Knative. I think you can take that. Yes. Another one is CNCF with um, Apache Foundation. Mm -hmm. I think it's just like a different foundation. Is is a foundation the same way that Apache Foundation is? CNCF is also uh, connected with Linux Foundation. That's a nice thing. So it's part of the Linux Foundation. I'm not sure Apache what's the connection exactly on Apache Foundation, but it's a foundation the same way. But if we want to compare, there's no well, there's the no much compare with K, K, K native, but you can go there if you want. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're interesting. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation was specifically designed for this. I mean, many open source foundations, you know, built specifically for specific things like such as the OpenStack Foundation. We have the Apache Foundation. All of these kind of host the projects that are relevant to those particular ecosystems. So the CNCF has been tailored to, to the Cloud Native 
side of things. It was built, you know, for Kubernetes and has been opened up to all of these um, projects. Um, it, it's particularly open for collaboration and and all of those side of things. So they they all coexist in that sense. And I would I would say the same thing about uh, the different projects within the foundation. So things like Knative and um, Kata, you know, they coexist. There are certain overlapping functionality. There's also unique functionality to each of them, and they each make different uh, trade offs in terms of being say. Uh, lightweight or tailored to a specific purpose or, um, you know, providing very rich functionality in other areas. And this is the, the wonderful thing about the whole, um, the whole ecosystem that you can sort of try and pick and, and look at the project that best suits your, suits your needs um, for, from that perspective. But thank you. Thank you very much for the question. So it's. Yeah. And now to any, any comments on that, uh, on Azure Container Apps, how, how you see that, how people in Brazil are, are looking for, you know, using, very new. Uh, is it? Uh, there is, uh, in my opinion, uh, many people interest in using this technology. Uh, as I, I said before, uh, I think it's more easier to, to go to Kubernetes with this, this service. Uh, but you, you must... Uh, understand what is happening so it's important to to learn more about kubernetes and uh, as a de developer it, it's something that i'm always trying to to do but for a uh, 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 some people that works more with infrastructure uh, on cloud uh, it's important to, uh, to to learn more about Kubernetes and services that uh, and solutions that uh, are used by Azure Container Apps. For a developer, uh, I use the Open Telemetry. So uh, when uh, you uh, demonstrate uh, the architecture of uh, Dapper uh, in the slide. Uh, it was interesting because you can see that uh, a lot of projects uh, that uh, are maintained by uh, Cloud Native uh, were, were incorporated uh, inside um, Azure Container Apps. So it's important to, to learn about uh, all these technologies uh, to obtain uh, the maximum of uh, benefits offered, in my opinion. And we certainly yeah. believe in building on top of these open source technologies and providing people that spectrum where we have a fully managed service, but people can go all the way to say, you know, you've got a managed container service container platform, but then you have Kubernetes where you get full open source Kubernetes, but then you can run your own and then you can run all of these projects you know, with nothing to do with any cloud infrastructure if you want to. And we always rely on the upstream open source um, implementations and, and versions of those things and maintain it all in the open. So this, what we have uh, on the screen... Sorry, go ahead, George. Sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so what we have here is um, the, another way of building your containers. Uh, and this is one of my favorite workflows. And I just want to show it off here because it is so incredibly easy. If you're a developer and you have your code inside of GitHub, as so many of us do, uh, we have the, the uh, GitHub docs here, which is an example of how to uh, manage a GitHub package uh, with, with workflows. This is going to build a container using Docker inside of your um, in, inside of GitHub Actions. And then it's going to push it to a GitHub container registry, which is free for public container images. So everybody who is on uh, GitHub is able to publish public images. This might be a piece of software that you want to be distributed and for anybody to be able to pull anonymously. Uh, it might also be an open source project in that, in that same space. Um, or you might want to take that and say, I use GitHub for my workflows and I want to do all that kind of thing and I want to take that image private and you can pay a little bit of money to uh, be able to run those and, and keep them private just like Azure can, you can with Azure Container Registry. But this is the workflow and how to take a build a GitHub Actions workflow so we see here in the docs, we can. this is a workflow that shows you how to build Docker. It doesn't require any authentication. It uses the built-in authentication inside of GitHub Actions. And we create a workflow by creating a new file, which is in the special folder called .workflows. Um, 
sorry, github slash workflows, and we'll call this one uh, deploy image.yaml. And then we've got this one here, and we'll go through, and you can see we're just pasting in this YAML straight from the docs. And this is a Go application, a very simple Hello World Go application used for load testing and a bunch of other things. It's got a few different endpoints on it. And you can see, if we go over to Actions, it hasn't built yet. And this is because this one is triggered by um, commits to a branch called Release. So these events go through, and in this case, they're being filtered, and the, any commit to the Release branch will trigger a new build of a container image. So I create the release branch over here. So you can just go over here and create it. And this is the first time I set this up inside of this repository. So this is me doing it inside of my repository. But then we'll show how you can take my repository with the workflow and then run it and build your own container image using this thing called a template repository, which this one is. So you can go out to this one publicly. You can see the same walkthrough in the aka.ms slash OSS dash lab. So you can do this exact same thing in the exact same time. And you can see that our application is being uh, built here. You can see the build and push image workflows is happening. And it happens really quite fast. Um, you can see the build is happening here, the building the Docker image. This is using something called a distroless container image. So this is a project from Google. Um, it builds, you might have heard of scratch images where there's basically nothing inside of your Docker image for a start. But distroless gives you all of the benefits of having the essential pieces you need. Uh, but without any of the things like package managers, et cetera. So in this case, what we're using is a base Golang image to actually build the application. Out of that, we get a single binary. And then that binary gets dropped into this distroless base layer using a multi-stage build. So this is worth considering. And there's various templates for all sorts of languages. There's Go, there's Python, there's Java, et cetera. And it's worth checking out as well from the um, repository here. So as you can see here, we've got this use as template repository button. So you can take my repository and you can create one here called serverless gopher and you can make it public or private. So it's not like a fork where the public one has to be public on your end. And you could take my public repository and make a template privately. And I'm calling this serverless gopher. And you can see the action hasn't run because I've only taken the main branch. I could have taken them all, but I've only taken the main branch. And then if we go over back to the, um, let's have a look here. We'll go back to the uh, branches here and we'll just create a release branch on our end. And you'll be able to see if we go to the actions again, that will now build. I didn't have to handle any authentication, no usernames, no passwords, no GitHub uh, personal access tokens or anything like that. And that will build the image. And these images are available uh, on my GitHub handle at the end of the GitHub handle or on our organization name. So you have one global namespace of images, which you can then use without having to create multiple different uh, you know, registries or namespaces or anything like that. It's all just available. And if they're public, somebody can come along to your GitHub uh, user and see them as packages, um, as part of the GitHub packages um, project. So we can go back over here. We go back to the main repo. We go down to packages. We can see we have the serverless gopher package, which is a Docker image. There are various other packages. And we can just grab our, um, we, could, we could grab that link. But if we go down here, we change the package settings. We can see that it will be private by default. So people can't publicly pull this thing, anonymously pull it from, uh, by default. But I can make this package public. And as soon as I do that, that will make it possible for anybody to anonymously pull down the, um, the image and, uh, or run it uh, if they need to run it in something like Azure Container Apps. And you'll see there's a walkthrough, much like the previous example with Azure Container Registry, but even faster, and how to take that particular thing. So you can just copy. You can see that fully qualified name, the ghcr.io slash serverless gopher. And you can see that the image is tagged, uh, the name of the branch, which is called release. Uh, was built a minute ago, and you can just grab that, and now you can drop that into the rest of the walkthrough, which I'd like to invite you all to go through. And if you have any questions and you're hacking on these things, feel free to uh, drop by and uh, come by the Microsoft Open Source Discord, which is at aka.ms slash open dash source dash discord. And I'll be gladly, um, you know, happy to help you through any of these things or answer any other questions you might have. Um, we do a lot of sort of hacking in labs and bits and pieces there. Yeah, that's great, uh, Erwin. 
you can use the same approach for the languages as well with GitHub. Yeah. You can build, you can use the, the registry as a And package. this is completely language agnostic. All you need is your code in a Docker file, and then suddenly you've got an image which can be used inside of serverless container platforms, inside of Kubernetes. If you do run it authenticated, you can use a, um, pers a, a token to actually enable your Kubernetes cluster to pull uh, a private image uh, down to the cluster. But this enables you to have both public and private distribution of container images, which is very helpful for a lot of open yeah. source projects too. We use that yeah, for Cater and Cater um, HTTP in particular. And we're going to have, a, I'm just got some, you know, roadmap for container apps. Uh, it's public, even Jeff Holland, if someone following Jeff Holland is the main stakeholder of the project. People know Jeff from the Azure Functions project. People in Australia, Jeff came here many times. And he just published on Twitter some roadmap, things like uh, the tooling for Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. I just show here the Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code extension is coming soon. Custom domain certificates, manage identity. A lot of people asking manage identity to connect some things on Azure from your container apps. Um, that will be available as well. There is a new CLI, improvements on CLI, on the documentation that Arrow and I are working close on that. And if you want to improve some documentation, please send feedback for us. It would be, be amazing. And now to people from Brazil, we want to you know, feedback on documentation. Probably need some translation of the language as well. But um, yeah, I count on you for, for that. Another thing is important for debugging for the developers is the streaming log. You're going to be able to see the logging and even connect on the containers to see what's going on. Similar to, I think you have a, on Azure Container Instance, you have on AKS, you're going to be able to do that on Azure Container Apps as well. I think those are the main, but there's a, you know some improvements on um, VNet connection on Container Apps is available already, but there are some limitations on that uh, for microservices that's coming as well. Um, I think that's the right time to, you know, to jump in on Container Apps and if you watch until now, or you watch the recording, say, and AKS, Azure, Azure Kubernetes service is still there. Then it's not going anywhere. It's just growing and growing and growing. And there are so many features, you know, um, on AKS in the last six months. It's very enterprise level, very production ready. Um, it's become almost like a platform as well. It's not fully managed. But the management side on AKS is growing. Means now have you know auto uh, nodes update. You can even choose you know the strategy you want for the updates. Um, I think you can schedule the maintenance you know window that you want to do that those upgrades. There are improvements on Im the, the image of the nodes that you want to use. You know configurations on the the image. A lot of enterprise level the private cluster now that you can have completely separate cluster. Another very important for the enterprise is um, you can have, um, how you call that? Like the, the host, it'll be like a dedicated, like, like we call an Azure dedicated host. You can use dedicated host on AKS now. And even if you look Brendan Burns Twitter, he said, ARM, the ARM architecture that was releasing public preview of the VMs for Azure, that's coming from AKS as well. Now you can have Windows nodes, Linux nodes, and ARM. That's amazing. There's so many like enterprise, enterprise level and like even bring ARM that, you know, I think if you try to use AKS before, I think that's a good time to try again. If you thought it was too hard, it's become easier and easier. And there's a lot of things that come out of the box. There are things that we call extensions or add-ons, where you can pick things like DEP, uh, Open Service Mesh for Service Mesh. You can just click a box and you're going to be installed. Integration with Key Vault now, you have CSI drivers. 
things that wasn't there like a year ago, Aaron. I'm trying to. One thing, one thing I'll call out. I've been there for a while, but even the ability, the integration to the portal is very deep. Not only just for the setting setting up of the cluster and the choosing of networking options and all of the con the upfront configuration. Uh, but even things like the ability to drill down into your namespaces and your pods and see what's running in the cluster, um, you know, right from within in the Azure portal without having to run Kub control or a, a terminal UI like K9s, K9s, which is fantastic, by the way. You should definitely try that. Um, but it, all of these things are, are becoming more and more um, integrated going forward. And uh, you'd be surprised by a lot of that functionality, I think. Yeah, I think I think we are a little bit over time. Um, let's do the final considerations. I think uh, Jose Silva is still asking about the K native and KDE. When to use one or another? That's one question that's reminding here. Um, but Renato, what do you think on the .NET side? What you saw here, what we discussed last week as well. Like the live that we did in Portuguese like last week is almost like a thousand views already, like in seven days or less. And um, means that there is a public interested to learn that and to go deeper. What's for the .NET developer? Many say, I don't have a laptop that can run Docker desktop. Uh, how are you going around those problems and tell them like create a VM, use code space, and get started is that that's the the advice or specifically for the for for the brazilian or some like some countries where they don't have a 16 gig laptop to get started uh something that i always uh, tell uh, people uh, you can use microsoft learn to to uh, know about a lot of service of azure e there are sent boxes so you can uh, use the sandbox and uh, it will be create, uh, created a, a temporary uh, subscription and you can test as a resource uh, for students uh, in uh, school, in technical schools and even universities here in Brazil. Uh, we always recommend uh, if you don't have a, a powerful notebook, a powerful uh, computer, you can try uh, the sandboxes in, in Microsoft Learn, and uh, for for some time, uh, one one hour, or even uh, some service when you have a, a lot of things to do in. An ex exercise, uh, Microsoft uh, reserves uh, two or even uh, four hours to to test as a resource. Uh, I think it's a, a a good solution when you don't have a a, a good computer to to test and uh, use containers. And I'll also say one, that. I think for Microsoft the, Learning Arrow, I think, is a big one. I think it's a good one because... And in addition to the sandbox, so you have lots of places you can run compute. So inside the Learn Sandbox, if you have an Azure free account, you can use the Azure Cloud Shell inside of, uh, inside of the Azure Portal, for example, and that has a sandbox that's actually running in a containerized environment. It doesn't have Docker because it's in the container itself but you can run all sorts of things, all your CLI tools, et cetera. Uh, at the Azure free accounts also come with a virtual machine. There's a, a burstable uh, Linux virtual machine and a Windows virtual machine, which a lot of people find uh, useful. And then there are also accounts, uh, you know, if you have a GitHub Actions, you've got a certain number of build minutes for free every month, which you can use to do build containers and things like that. So you can have a completely remote development environment. If you have a web browser, Today, you can build for the cloud. It really doesn't depend so much on the local uh, power that you have there either. So it makes it very accessible, definitely more accessible than um, when I was doing a lot of work in my earlier years in particular. Yeah. I think my advice would be good space as well on GitHub. Yep. Code space is so fast, so flexible. Come with Docker. means that you can use something like Kine, like we discussed. We have videos here, but like the Azure Attack community videos where we have videos in English and Portuguese explaining how to use those options, kind, micro K3D, with Docker, Rancher Desktop, 
And there are videos here on the React to explain you know, the code space. It's very simple. You just go there, click create a virtual machine, connect your Git repository on GitHub. Um, and you have Docker out of the box. It means that uh, it's a very nice way to get it started. It's very fast. And you can you can install like a kind that's be a Kubernetes classes inside your code space. Means that there is no dependency on your machine, local machine could be very you know simple machine, like four gig Windows or Linux or, or Mac machine that you can access the browser and you could be able to use that powerful machine on code space. And you can select two cores, four cores, I think, like some memory, and you pay just for the for the time that you use. It's cost effective, in my opinion. And you can have multiple and just pay when you use that. Yeah, I find that's that's quite powerful if you have projects like let's say you've got a quite a heavy build process, like you've got a, something in Rust or something like that, where it's got a lot of things to build. Maybe also for bandwidth purposes, maybe you're pulling and pushing images. If you particularly if you're on a low bandwidth connection, I often uh, build things on LTE or in mobile or on lower bandwidth connections where pushing a Docker file up to the cloud is either expensive or it's timely. Timely, you could be on a plane, whereas these things all ha if it all happens in the cloud, um, it can be that much more efficient. And you do only pay for the time that that thing is running. It still costs you know, compared to some of the other free options, but it really is just for the moments that you're using it, which is beneficial. And another one that I like as well, if you get the free Linux VM that you have on Azure, with the Azure subscription free, the free subscription, you can open your local Visual Studio code that's light, you know, it's not heavy, and you can connect using SSH, remote SSH, yep. means that you connect the Linux VM and the VS code will be running inside the Linux VM, but looks like that you're running inside your machine. Mm -hmm. But because VS code is like a browser-based application that looks like a desktop, um, everything will be running on the VM, but you're still working on your laptop like a browser. It works the same way, and it's a very nice way as well. You can stop the VM, stop paying for the VM, and you have the same thing. It's very similar to like Codespace does, but you know you can manage the VM if that's the way that you want. Even for for companies, startups, you can do the same as well. I have my VM there. I want to manage my VM, but I still using my VS Code to connect there. If you don't want to use any like remote, you know, local containers like with Docker Desktop or Rancher Desktop, that's another option. Means that even like a four gig machine probably be able to to do that. And interestingly enough, you know, I, I like these remote development environments. I even get, dial in from my iPad. Like I have a shell on my iPad, which connects to something in the cloud over a, a VPN or something like that. Uh, if you an emergency, if you're on call or something, you could access something, a small command line utility on, on your phone, on Android or iPhone or something like that. So it's all of those things are options too. Well, I think we are a lot over time here. Thanks a lot. Um, I really appreciate it's just like insight. I think we can maybe organize other days to go deeper on each of those topics. Yes. Local development, container apps, maybe AKS, a little bit deeper. And um, and also those options, you know, local development. I think Renato is going to do one in Portuguese on Monday, Renato. Fantastic. About, uh, about kinds. Yes, I, I will demonstrate some examples. Uh, we are always doing events uh, about Kubernetes, and uh, I think it's a, a good option if you need to test your application, even debug some application running on, on Kubernetes. So uh, I, I will try to... Uh, I'm creating some examples using Kind. Maybe maybe you can talk to Sarah or someone in Brazil, Victor, and and maybe bring this to the reactor. I think it'll be a nice one to have in Portuguese as well. Explain how to use you know the local kind Kubernetes environment, and maybe you can do another in English here, going deeper on kind. I think kind is one most used on CNCF projects like Brigade, like I'm working with Brigade, and yeah, I think it's a very good one. Just but to bring it. Just to bring one final layer of inception to you, I happen to know, since GitHub Actions runs Docker, you can run Kubernetes in Docker inside of GitHub Actions to run a testing pipeline against Kubernetes. A couple of uh, gopher cons ago, myself and a colleague built a, a lab around that, uh, which you can find online via these, some of these links. 
Um, and that's another fun use of, of the Kubernetes and Docker uh, concept as well. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, one of my favorite projects as well. In the virtual environments of GitHub Actions and the Azure Pipeline, Skyd kind is uh, installed by default. And you can use kind during the execution of a uh, pipeline. I, I always use uh, containers uh, for some kind of uh, integration test uh, with my applications, but I may, I, I saw kind uh, installed, so I, I will try in the future to use kind in a pipeline or people, workflow. I think. People, assume, people assume that you have to go out and create a cluster outside of your actions workflow, but it's amazing that Kubernetes will scale and run inside your CI CD pipeline sort of on demand, which is... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very nice for integration testing where you have to really deploy the application and you really see the things working. And imagine you create a cluster, deploy everything, run the integration tests, and just destroy the whole thing. It's all running inside. I say like it could be even Azure DevOps agent works as well, or GitHub Actions agent. They're very similar and they all be running inside it. Then you you can even do multiple content clusters and and doing different tests. So it's very, very nice. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks Thank for you having us. us. Look forward to speaking soon. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thanks, Renato. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, just to remind to, to everyone, all those links um, that we spoke about throughout the session are in the chat there, um, including the ones to the YouTube channel um, and GitHub. And um, if you wanted to use any of uh, watch back any session after this, you can do so on our YouTube channel. So all there and the survey as well. Thank you. Have a good rest of your afternoon, evening or morning, wherever you joined us from in the world today. And we'll see you next time for another Microsoft Reactor live stream event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.